welcome to Zion Teacher Series. Today's teacher is Dr. Brian J. Bailey. Dr. Bailey is an internationally known Bible teacher and prolific author of over 35 books, which have been translated into more than 25 languages. In his over 50 years of ministry, Dr. Bailey has traveled to over 100 countries, ministering in churches, Bible schools, pastors' conferences, and leadership seminars. Dr. Bailey is currently the president of Zion Fellowship International and senior pastor of Zion Chapel, both of which are located in Waverly, New York, overlooking O'Brien's Restaurant and Hotel. He is also president of Zion Ministerial Institute and Zion University, which has over 30 affiliated Bible schools worldwide. In today's edition of Zion Teacher Series, Dr. Bailey will speak from the book of Genesis. Dr. Bailey will speak from the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. It lays the foundation for the whole of the Word of God. Understanding this foundational book will help to give insight and relevance to issues that confront us today. May we learn from the historical accounts that are recorded in this great book and grasp the significance of God's blueprint that the book of Genesis provides for our lives. Let us open our hearts and receive all that God has for us through his word. Welcome to our study on the book of Genesis. It's a very exciting subject because, as we know, Genesis is a book of beginnings And we shall find in this wonderful book essentially where everything begins. We find, for example, there's the beginning of civilization, beginning of mankind, beginning of vegetation, the animal life, marriage, sin, redemption, murder, polygamy, musical instruments. In fact, the beginning of the human race before the flood. But before we look at this book of Genesis, which is essentially the account that God gave to man through Moses, for this is also called the first book of Moses, there being five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Uh, This book that was given by God through Moses is called the history, if I could say this, of the human race and also the explanation of creation. But as we well know, this episode, if I could say this, concerning creation has been challenged by those who declare that mankind has evolved. Well, where did that start? That started in about 1859 with a book by Charles Darwin called The Origin of Species. And in this book, Charles Darwin suggested that man had evolved from a monkey and then he suggested that in actuality the whole of the heavens and the earth all evolved from a big explosion. Well, there is no scientific facts that will support that theory. In fact, Darwin was tormented often throughout his life realizing that he could not substantiate his own theory. And yet scientists have picked it up and declared, yes, evolution is right. But the interesting thing about the scientists, they all declare that from their own disciplines, from their own particular aspect of science, they cannot prove evolution. Well, why do the scientists say we evolved? I think the answer is very clear. It is not a scientific fact, but it's a philosophical fact. And it's interesting that the scientists have accepted this philosophical fact. And in the words of Aldous Huxley, who was one of the foremost scientists to support this theory of Charles Darwin, he acknowledged that uh, he had no proof whatsoever from science that evolution was right, but instead from his books, Ends and Means, He said, my motive for not wanting the world to have been created was simply this, 
that I wanted it to be meaningless. In other words, without meaning, without purpose. And he said, in so doing, I would be liberated from all moral and sexual restraints. And in actuality, that is the reason for evolution. That is why some people hold on to evolution, because they want to believe, but in their heart they cannot. They want to believe that evolution is right, so therefore there will be no responsibility or accountability for man at the end of his life. Well, it might interest you to know that one of the descendants of Aldous Huxley, Sir Julian Huxley, was the first director of UNESCO. And he made the point that the United Nations must be founded upon this theory of evolution. And that is why, in actuality, the United Nations make such a mess of things because they do not look to God for direction, but rather to men. Well, it's interesting that Jeremiah the prophet made this declaration. He said, it is not in man to direct his ways. No, God created the heavens of the earth. God created this earth with purpose and in actuality, scientists acknowledge that even down to the smallest atom, all the structure is so perfect, showing a God of order. In fact, the Apostle Paul could state in Romans chapter 1 and verse 19, 20, 21, he could state this, that from the things that are made, we can understand the character of God, his power, and his glory. And what does creation teach us? It teaches us order and responsibility. Now then, we are going to look, therefore, into this book of Genesis, and we are going to see God's account of how he created the heavens and the earth. And it starts off in the beginning. And in a, essentially that's what Genesis means. The beginnings, the beginnings of all things. And as we understand the beginnings, we can actually understand the future. That is the wonder of this marvelous book, the book of Genesis. Well, it starts off in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth goes on to say that the earth was without void. Darkness covered the deep. And then we have a chronology of how God brought this wonderful earth and heavens into being. It was done in six days. And in the first day, God spoke these words let there be light, and there was light. You know, the word of God is so powerful, it is creative. And the wonderful thing about light is this, that it is far greater than darkness. In fact, the Apostle John, speaking on the two, light and darkness, says that darkness could not overcome light. And that's very wonderful indeed because the Lord Jesus Christ is called the light of the world which means Satan who is the prince of darkness cannot overcome him because light defeats darkness. Have you ever been into a very dark room? Absolutely no light at all and you have lit a tiny match. You know, with all the darkness around, it cannot extinguish that match. And that match, if you hold it, can show you where you're going. You see, this is the point that God wants us to understand, that we are the children of light, 
not the children of darkness. And therefore, as children of light, we can overcome all the powers of darkness. And also, a very important point is this, that God separated light and darkness. And he called light day and darkness night. And what do we associate with night? Everything that is evil. What do we associate with light? Everything that is good. And that's the correct way, and that's the correct assessment. For the light of the world, as I've already said, is the Lord Jesus Christ, full of all goodness and kindness. Whereas the night governed by Satan is indeed filled with all evil. But light overcomes darkness. Well, the first day, God made a separation. And that's very important. We as the children of light should be separated from darkness. We should be separated from all that is evil. We should indeed major on goodness and kindness and love, the virtues of of the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. And all hatred, envy, evil speaking, and every evil work we should be separated from. God made a separation. God is a God of separation. And so should we be too. Well, we come now to the second day. And here God made another separation. A separation between the heaven above and the earth below. And you know, heaven speaks of spiritual life. Earth speaks of carnal or fleshly life. And again, we want to have a spiritual life whereby indeed we are looking heavenward. We are looking forward to that paradise that awaits all the children of God who follow the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to look heavenward and the things of earth will grow strangely dim as we do. But you see, we want in our heart the things of heaven to fill that heart of ours because as our heart is, so are we. And so... Again, a separation between heaven and earth. And then on the third day, God gathered the waters and he brought them into one place and he called it sea. And then the land that emerged, he called the earth. And then God spoke and trees and grass came forth. And here is a very significant statement in creation. It says, trees came forth after their kind with their seed in themselves. Now, this is a very important truth because we understand it clearly that an apple tree will only produce apples. With every good intent, an apple tree will never produce oranges because God has decreed it that every tree brings forth after its kind. And therefore an apple brings forth apples, oranges bring forth oranges, potatoes bring forth potatoes, and so forth. But also, there's a spiritual significance here, dear ones. You see, we reproduce who we are. And therefore, it's very important when we think of our children or before we have children to realize that they're going to be very much like we are. Those of you who are married, it doesn't take long for your wife to tell you that you are just like your father. In other words, some perceived imperfections in your life 
the wife clearly sees that they have come from your father and there's a lot of truth in that but my point is this that there's a, a very serious side I want to think of King David King David well with Bathsheba committed adultery and they had a son and that son was Solomon for 19 years David carefully instructed with Bathsheba their son Solomon knowing that God had promised that one day Solomon would sit upon the throne of Israel and they realized that their sin had been transmitted to Solomon this lust this sexual iniquity well in the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs King David gives instruction to Solomon and so often he speaks of the strange woman so often he speaks on the sanctity of marriage why? he knows the weakness that he has given to Solomon and therefore he gave instruction after instruction as did Bathsheba about the strange woman but Solomon did not take that into account and while Solomon became one of the wisest men that ever lived he did not take care of that strain in his character that David and Bathsheba had given him and the result was he had about a thousand wives and those wives led him away from God now we reproduce after our kind an orange after an orange an apple after an apple but also if we have a besetting sin in our life a fault in our character that is going to be transmitted to our children and therefore it behoves us actually before we have children to seek God to have a clean heart and cry unto him O oh God create in me a clean heart that we don't transmit the iniquities of previous generations to those that are coming well that is one of the awesome if I could say this lessons of creation now we come to the fourth day and the fourth day God created the lights in heaven the greater light the sun the lesser light the moon and then the stars and the reason for that is given to us that they are to give days, weeks and years in other words by the stars, by the sun, by the moon we have the division of the years into months, weeks and days but there is a spiritual signification also in what God does the sun speaks of the sun of righteousness the Lord Jesus Christ the moon which is the reflected glory of the sun typifies the church and the stars we are told by Daniel the prophet in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3 that those who turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars for ever and ever and so as you look up into the sky and you see the sun realize that the sun is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ watching over his creation for he was the co-creator of the world with his father and then when you see the moon so glorious that's what God wants his church to be without any spot or blemish and then look at those stars how wonderful it would be that we be shining as the stars forever and ever 
And how will that be? If we turn many to righteousness. Well, there comes the fifth day. And on the fifth day, God spoke to the waters, to the seas. And he commanded that they bring forth fish, large whales, smaller kinds. And he made the point. He said, be fruitful, multiply. And then he spoke the fowl or the birds into existence. And again, he made this point that they would bring off, uh, reproduce, if I could say this, or bring forth after their own kind. You know, minnows produce minnows. Goldfish produce goldfish. Whales produce whales. Why? God has an ordered society. Even amongst the animals and the fish and so forth. And we have a saying, you know, birds of a feather flock together. We have in the grounds of our college, you know, at times, blackbirds with two red stripes. It's interesting. They don't mix with other blackbirds. They're only mixed with those of their same kind. God making a distinction. God making a distinction and uh, emphasizing that we reproduce after our kind. The righteous reproduce righteous people. Evil reproduce evil people. And again, I would cry out to you, you know, oh God, give me a clean heart so that my children may be children of light and goodness. Well, we come to the sixth day And in the sixth day, God spoke and he brought forth the cattle, the beasts of the earth, the creeping things. And then everything was ready for God's masterpiece, man. You know, man is like no other. Man was made in the very image, that is a physical image, of God and also in the likeness of God and the interesting thing is this that when you read in the word of God concerning him it speaks of him having hands speaks of him as having eyes and so forth we are made in the very likeness the very image of God but also it speaks of the fact that we have the same character as God. And so, it is interesting that when we consider mankind, we are considering not only someone who has bears the image of God, but also the character and nature of God. And looking at our, even our physical being. We can understand how King David cries out in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Then something else concerning man. God decreed this, that man should have dominion over all his creation and that the fear of man would indeed be in the beasts of the field and so forth well at times I've remembered that for example I was in Oregon oh many years ago I had never really ridden on a horse but uh, some fellow Christians and pastors uh, took me to a ranch and it was springtime and the horses were just being let out for the first time. And uh, everybody mounted their horses, and I mounted mine, but the horse knows the rider. And the horse knew that I didn't know how to ride. And they're a bit honorary, 
you know, the first time they come out. And whilst the others were under the control of experienced riders and they trotted off, my horse refused to move. I didn't know how to get him to move. And then this scripture came to me. Well, man has dominion over the horses. And I put my hand upon the horse's head and I said, man has dominion over the horses. I have dominion over you. Now you go. And he trotted peacefully off. Also experienced that in Africa with lions and elephants, you know, being confronted with them, but having the assurance that God had put the fear of man into those wild beasts. They didn't attack me, but they went from me. You know, man is given dominion over all God's creation. And how important it is to realize this, that in summating this lesson, that God created the heavens and the earth with perfect order. The stars remain in their courses. And that is why you can take an almanac and that is why you can look at stars and, you know, you can calculate your position upon earth because the stars remain in their course. The sun remains in its course. The moon, likewise. See, God is a God of order. Everything from the beginning bringing forth after his kind. You know what it says? God looked and saw that it was good. He had a perfect creation because he is a perfect God. And therefore, I would encourage you to meditate upon this. You know, we have responsibility we have dominion over his creation and God did not make this earth in vain but in purpose. He created us as he says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 to be fruitful and to multiply and cover the earth because God is a God of abundance and we are going to see how this wonderful creation fell because of disobedience of man. But let us, in conclusion, contemplate as we go out and see the beauty of his creation, how beautiful God is, and that he wants not only his creation, but man to reflect the beauty of his creator too. May God bless you. Amen.